In 1918, after Russian troops have withdrawn, a new Armenian Republic is established in the Caucasus, with its capital in Yerevan. The Armenian government believes that its people have a historical claim to a large region in eastern Turkey. After the Ottoman Empire surrenders to the Allies, Yerevan sends its troops to occupy the area. But the Turkish nationalists also see the region as part of their traditional homeland. In the fall of 1919, Turkish troops commanded by General Kazim Karabakir advance against the Armenians and in a series of battles, steadily push them back toward the Caucasus. As the fighting continues for another year, the Western powers change their minds about helping Armenia and withdraw their support. In December 1920, the Armenian government signs a treaty with the Turkish nationalists. The following spring, Ankara signs another treaty with Vladimir Lenin in Moscow, and the eastern borders of Turkey are secured. As for the Armenian Republic, its independence is short-lived. Soviet troops and political commissars take control in Yerevan, and Armenia becomes part of the Soviet Union. It will not achieve independence again until 1991. While they drive Armenians out of the east, Kemalist forces also attack French and Armenian troops that occupy an area in southeastern Turkey known as Cilicia. From February to April of 1920, Turkish forces score several victories. The new French Prime Minister, Alexander Miron, is under pressure to demobilize the French army while still holding on to Syria. He orders his commanders to find a way out and start negotiating with Kemal. Lloyd George, on the other hand, rejects conciliation and sends British troops to occupy Istanbul. Churchill urges him to make peace with Kemal, believing that a solid agreement with Ankara is the best way to stop communist expansion. Meanwhile, the Soviets reach an understanding with the Turks. Moscow fears the growth of British influence in the Middle East, so it decides to support the Kemalist government and begins to funnel money and weapons to the Turkish nationalists. In the spring of 1921, French diplomat Henry Franklin Bouillon goes to Ankara and reaches an accord that ends the conflict in Turkey. Paris formally recognizes the legitimacy of the Ankara government and will no longer deal with the Sultan in Istanbul. The Treaty of Sevres is cancelled, and Lloyd George's carefully drawn map of the Middle East is now a meaningless piece of paper. Britain feels betrayed by this separate peace engineered by the French. London and Paris, two governments that suffered through the Great War together, are no longer allies in the war that continues in the Middle East. By October 1921, all French and Armenian forces are evacuated from Turkey. Now General Kemal and his army can focus on yet another enemy, the Greek army that lies to the west. In mid-June 1920, London approaches Greek Prime Minister Venizelos for help in defeating the Turkish nationalists, who have even begun to attack British troops in Istanbul. The Allies agree to let Greek forces advance from Izmir into Turkey, and on June 22nd, the invasion begins. By the following year, Greek troops have advanced deep into Turkish territory. An exultant Lloyd George proclaims, Turkey is no more. But the Turks themselves aren't convinced. Kemal plans to use the same strategy employed by the Russians against Napoleon in 1812 draw the enemy into the interior, wear them down, and then counterattack. Arnold Toynbee, a historian who reports on the campaign for the Manchester Guardian, writes the following. I began to realize on how narrow a margin the Greeks had gambled for a military decision, and how adverse were the circumstances under which they were playing for victory over Kemal. At the end of March 1921, the Turks repel three strong Greek attacks and hold their ground. In July, King Constantine of Greece takes personal command of his forces in Turkey 
and strikes in a brilliant attack that drives the enemy back toward Ankara. General Kamal calls his National Assembly into secret session and offers a desperate solution. He asks his government to make him supreme commander with dictatorial powers for three months. If he fails to turn back the Greek army, the blame will fall entirely on him. The assembly agrees. Kamal and his second-in-command, Ismet Inonu, pull their troops back to within 50 miles of Ankara and build a strong defensive position along the Sakarya River with concentric rings of trenches. In late August, Constantine's army attacks again, driving the Turks back at the rate of a mile per day. The two sides fight savagely for weeks. Then Kamal sends his cavalry to attack the exposed Greek supply lines. Constantine fears that his army may be surrounded. With his troops exhausted and his supply base 350 miles away, Constantine decides to fall back. After repelling the enemy tide at the gates of Ankara, the Turkish army takes an entire year preparing for its next move. The Turkish people have been busy making bullets and hand grenades, putting machine guns together, making uniforms and boots, giving up food and other supplies for the army of Kamal. Everyone is mobilized for total war against the Greeks. In late August 1922, Turkish forces begin their counterattack, moving toward Izmir along the railroad line and north toward the city of Bursa. After several days of brutal combat, the Greek army retreats. Athens appeals urgently to Lloyd George for military assistance. But the British Prime Minister can do nothing, replying that he is one of three people in London who support the Greek occupation. At Izmir, a fleet of ships hastily assembles to evacuate the defeated Greek army. It has lost 200,000 men since the invasion began. Masses of soldiers, as well as thousands of Greek civilians, are taken aboard a hodgepodge of ships from a variety of countries as the Turkish army continues to advance. In the midst of this chaos, a fire breaks out in the city and quickly spreads. About half of Izmir is destroyed as thousands die in the flames. General Kamal's army enters the ruins of a once beautiful city on September 11, 1922. But the Greek soldiers are gone. Even as Izmir still smolders, the Turkish commanders prepare to march against the British in Istanbul. An army that London has underestimated since 1914 still poses a threat eight years later. They like to attack. The commanders like to attack. They like to encircle their enemies. They use German models. They were thought to be a liability. The British consistently underestimated them. Two years after Gallipoli in 1917, the British were still underestimating the Turks and unable to batter through the Turkish defenses at Gaza. As the Turkish army moves closer to Istanbul, the British decide to negotiate after all. General Charles Harrington arranges a truce and another war against the Turks is averted. General Kemal and his troops march into the capital unopposed. The Turkish people can finally share the joy that was felt in Paris and London four years ago. The enemy has finally been driven out. World War I in the Middle East is over. On July 24th, 1923, the great powers sign a treaty with the Turkish government in the Swiss city of Lausanne. Now the borders of Turkey and the government in Ankara are recognized by all of Europe. On October 29, 1923, Mustafa Kemal, who helped to save his nation on the fields of Gallipoli, becomes the first president of the Turkish Republic.